For this microservice, we're going to use Redis as our primary data store. Redis is an in-memory data structure store, which makes it blazingly fast. There is one caveat to Redis, however, and that is the data stored is typically ephemeral and doesn't usually persist across restarts. This isn't always the case though, as you can configure Redis to be persistent and fault tolerant. It's not as safe as using something like Postgres, however, but for this tutorial, it'll be pretty good to use. In fact, we're going to design our system in such a way that our data store is actually going to be agnostic. You could easily switch this out for another system and just implement the same methods. In the meantime, however, we've got a bit of prep work to do. The first thing is adding a suitable third-party Redis dependency to our project. The recommended client is Go Redis, which can be found on GitHub at redis slash go redis. The current version at the time of recording is v9. We can add this to our project using the familiar go get command we saw earlier on in the series. With go redis added, we now need to get an instance of redis running so that we can develop against it. There's a couple of ways to do this. The easiest way is to go ahead and install it on our system using a package manager. On macOS, we can do this using the command of brew install redis, provided we have homebrew installed. On Linux, well, whatever package manager your distro uses. Once Redis is installed, you can then start it by using your operating system's service manager, which for macOS using Homebrew is Brew Services Start Redis. The other approach for installing Redis is to use Docker, provided that you have that installed. To install Docker for Mac, head on over to the Docker website and head to the Getting Started guide. Here you'll find installation instructions and installers for getting started. If you're using Homebrew, you can install it here as well by typing in the following command. Once it's installed, go ahead and open it up on macOS to start it. You can then confirm everything is running as expected by typing in docker ps, and you should get a similar response to what I am. With docker installed, it's actually pretty easy to get Redis started. First, make sure to stop any running Redis instance you have currently, especially if you followed my previous steps. Then, all you need to do is type in the following command, which will download and run the latest Redis image, and will bind your system's 6379 port to the Docker container's 6379 port. We can now check that Redis is running using the Redis CLI. You'll need to make sure this is installed. If you installed Redis using your system's package manager, this should come with it. To test out our Redis instance, first type in Redis CLI, and if everything is working correctly, you should see a prompt without any errors. You can validate this by typing in the keys command, which should produce an empty list at this stage. If everything's working as expected, we can move on to the next stage. To start, we're going to want to consider where our Redis instance will live in our current code structure. When it comes to building microservices, they're typically deployed in orchestration systems, such as Kubernetes or ECS. Because of this, we can actually rely on those systems to handle fault tolerance for us. And this means we can remove a large amount of code that we'd otherwise have to be concerned with, especially about retrying connection logic to our data store. This also helps to split out some separation of concerns. So what we're going to do is just attempt to connect to Redis during our application startup. Otherwise, we'll just stop the server from proceeding and exit early. Pretty easy logic. Because of this, it feels natural to place our Redis client as being owned by the application. And so that's what we're gonna do. Let's jump on into our application slash app.go file and add in a new property into our app struct for storing our Redis client. Let's call this RDB. Next, we can jump into our constructor and add the following line, which will create a new instance of our Redis client and assign it to this new property. With our property added, we can go ahead and connect to Redis during our application startup. The Redis client actually manages the connection state internally, which is pretty nice. However, it's still worthwhile to conform to our activity diagram and exit early if we're not able to connect to Redis during the start function. Therefore, to prompt a connection, we can use the ping method of the Redis client which will return an error if it's not able to connect. To do this, let's add in the following line. This code calls the ping method of the Redis client. You'll notice that we're passing in our parameter of our context. We'll be talking about that shortly, but it's a good thing we're passing it in already. You'll also notice we're calling the dot error function on the result of this ping method. This is part of the Redis API and is needed in order to determine if an error actually occurred. As this returns an error, we need to handle this if it exists. Let's add our if error block and then wrap our error using the format.errorf method. Now we actually need to change our other error assignment below when we start up our server. This is because we're using the colon equals operator, which is known as the shorthand operator. 
This operator performs two actions, initialization and assignment. Because we're initializing an error variable earlier than this line, we no longer need to initialize another one. So we can just change this to be an assignment operator instead, which will please the compiler. Finally, it's a good idea for us to add a print line statement just to see what's going on and that everything is working as expected. Let's go ahead and add this line just before we start our server. Okay, jumping over to a new terminal window because our previous one is running our Redis instance, let's give this a go. If we start our Go app, we can see that everything seems to be working. However, let's actually confirm this by checking the error case. To do this, we can stop our Redis Docker container and go ahead and run our application again. This time we can see that it causes an error to be printed to the console and it stops the server from even starting up. This is really nice and what we want. Now that we have our Redis client in place and we're successfully connecting to our Redis server, we need to start thinking about our application lifecycle a little more thoughtfully. The next thing we're going to implement is graceful termination. Graceful termination or graceful shutdown is where our application shuts down properly when it receives a signal to terminate. We currently send a signal whenever we press Ctrl C, which is used to cancel our server instance and close it down. In a Unix system, this is done by sending a signal called SIGINT, which stands for Signal Interrupt, and is what happens whenever you press Ctrl C on a process. In Go, we can actually set up a listener for this signal. This allows us to intercept it and to start to close down our application gracefully. This means if we're in the middle of any operations, such as writing to a database or handling any HTTP requests, We'll finish them up or tell the client that we were not successful and then terminate. To do this, we're going to use the context package, which provides a mechanism for communicating and handling cancellation. As many Go packages are heavily concurrent under the hood, this type is really important for telling Go routines when to finish processing. You'll notice that all of the Redis methods accept a context.context .context as the initial parameter, and that's for this very reason. First, let's head back to our main.go function where we marked the context.todo. Here we want to change this to use our own context that will respond to any interrupt signals. To do this, we can use the os slash signals package, which provides a function called notify context. This method takes in a context and a signal and will return another context that will be notified if the signal is created. But what context do we pass as the initial parameter? Well, contexts are actually derived from one another, sort of like a tree. This means that if any parent contexts are canceled, then all of the child ones will be canceled as well. This allows us to easily derive behaviors from a root level context. Because we don't have any other context to derive from at this stage, then we need to define a root level context ourselves. We can do this using the context.background function. You should ever only use the context.background function to derive a new context from, as using this directly with other context parameters can cause things to block indefinitely. If you read the documentation, it mentions that it should only be used by the main function initialization, and tests. This matches our current use case as we're in the main function. With our context parameter defined, let's take a look at the signal parameter. For this, we want to pass in the os.signalInterrupt, which represents sigint. If we wanted to, we could also pass in other signals to this function, as it expects a variadic parameter. But sigint is sufficient for what we want to listen for, and anything else is probably not wise. The signal notify function returns two different results. The first one being our newly derived context. Let's go ahead and add this to our application start method to pass it down to our application, replacing the context.todo function we were using before. The second parameter is the cancellation function, which is linked to our derived context. If we call this function, it will cancel our derived context and any of the children underneath it. We don't want to do that to the end of this function really, so let's add a line to do that. We could also use the defer keyword to achieve the same thing as well, which signals to go that this cancel function should be called at the end of the current function it's in, which is our main function. Okay, so now we're sending down our new context. Let's make some changes to perform our graceful shutdown. Jumping on over to our app.start method, let's add the following line to run our server concurrently using what's called a go routine. This starts a new anonymous function in a new thread of execution and ensures that it doesn't block our main thread. After this change, you'll see that the editor is calling out an error for returning an error in this function. This is to be expected. That's because we're attempting to return an error value in a function that no longer does so. So how do we solve this? Well, we're going to use something called a channel to do so. A channel is a type that allows for communication across Go routines. We'll basically use this to send the error back to our main thread. 
To do this, let's first create the channel using the following line. What this does is call the make function on a channel which is defined by the chan keyword, which has an associated type of error. Every channel in Go always comes with an associated type, which defines the type that will be sent across the threads. In our case, an error. The last argument we provide to the make function is the integer of one. This specifies the buffer size of our channel. Channels typically come either buffered or unbuffered. This basically determines when the writer or publisher to a channel will be blocked. In an unbuffered channel, the writer will always be blocked whenever they write to a channel until that value is read off of the channel. In a buffered channel, the writer will not be blocked until the buffer size is met. Most of the time, an unbuffered channel is what you want. But in our case, we know that only one value will ever be written and we don't want this Go routine to block if no one is reading from it. So a buffer size of one makes sense. Now let's use this channel in our server Go routine. We can replace our return keyword with the following code. This is the syntax to publish a value onto the channel. Here we're basically sending the error to anyone who is listening. As we're using a buffer channel, this won't block, which allows the Go routine to continue processing. You'll see why we want this shortly. Next, we'll add in the close method at the bottom, which closes the channel when this function is done. Closing a channel will also send a signal to anyone listening to that channel that the channel was done, which informs the reader to stop expecting data on it. Okay, now we want to set up a receiver for our channel. We can do this by adding in the following line, which will capture any value sent on this channel into our error variable. This line itself will actually block our code's execution until it either receives a value or the channel is closed, in which the value will be nil. We can actually check if the channel was closed by receiving a second return value, which is a boolean that describes the current state of the channel, open if true or closed if false. Now that we have a basic understanding of channels, we can look at the second part of our context. Inside, there is a method called done. This method actually returns a channel inside, which is how we're signaled if the channel has been canceled. We want to use this in conjunction with our error channel to determine when we'll close. But how do we listen to two channels at once if they block? Well, we can do this using the select keyword. The select keyword works very similar to a switch statement, but for channels, and allows us to block on multiple channels at once. Then the first channel that has its value to be read or is closed will have its case resolved and the code will be able to continue. So let's add in the following code to allow for a select statement for our error channel and the done method of our context. In the error case, let's go ahead and return this error to the caller. By the way, this select statement is why we're using a buffer for our error channel. In the event that this channel is not called first, then we won't read from this channel again, and therefore we don't want to wait for our server's Go routine to be deadlocked. Okay, let's go ahead and add the done case for our channel. In here, we're going to want to call our server's shutdown method. However, in this method, we need to pass another context. We could pass the same context we've already been using, but this will prohibit any graceful termination as the context has already been cancelled at this point, so there'll be no time for any requests in flight to be resolved. So we need to create a brand new context using the context.background function. But remember, if we use this by itself, then our shutdown could run indefinitely, which isn't what we want. So we can add a timeout to this by using the context.withTimeout function. Let's set this to run for a maximum of 10 seconds which should be more than enough time for any in-flight requests to resolve. Finally, we need to make sure we close our Redis instance as well. Given that we now have multiple return points, it can be a little bit cumbersome to add this to both parts of our code. Fortunately, we can refer back to the defer keyword we saw earlier to make sure this happens whenever the start function ends. We won't call this directly, however, as the function returns an error, which doesn't work with the defer keyword. To solve this, we can wrap the call in an anonymous function that the defer keyword can use. Then inside of this function, we can perform an if error check and print out the error if one was encountered when closing our Redis client. With that, we have graceful shutdown implemented. Let's go ahead and quickly test that everything is working as expected and then go and commit this to Git before moving on to our next part, which is the integration between Redis and our HTTP handlers. To begin, we need to define what our data model would look like.